Carol has fabulously managed to print um, these superb books. Um, She's got a lot of mileage for that $20,000 grant, I, I must say. And uh, you can actually collect um, copies for yourself where you'll find these beautifully produced um, booklets. Science Made Marvelous, what a wonderful initiative. Um, we're also going to be having readings um, from these books. Uh, that's what my call sheet says. So um, could I please call up... Um, could I please call up David Mortimer, who's going to do Singularity? Superb. Thank you, David. Thank you, and thank Carol and, and the Poets Union and all the other um, partners in putting this together. Um, the poem Singularity is more about uh, philosophy of science than science, really. One, one day I, I took issue with the law of causation, um, the idea that every event has a cause. People are inclined to suggest some events don't have causes, uh, things like God or the Big Bang or certain behaviour at the quantum level. I found myself going further and uh, suggesting that no event has a cause. <coughs> Singularity. Causation is nowhere if all the world is one event. Spring of a butterfly's wing, stiff with no meaning in the cyclone's course. And billiard balls and planets sent at angles skewed like letters in a name, told like whimsies in a story that accumulate but lay no claim to deeper plays of force on force or formulae for simpler glory, more than the one continual unfolding awkward shape that always was, already all of space and time and holding everywhere at bay, the word, because. Thank you, da thank you, David. That's from that particular one, Holding Patterns. Uh, next, we have Jan Owen. Where are you, Jan? Come on up. Thank you. I'm just trying to work out which category I'd fit into, Carol, because I started off in a very modest way with science and did arts and came back to writing about science. I, I, at 16, I went to work in the plant physiology department at the Waite. And although I liked librarianship, I realised at that stage I really should have done maths and chemistry because I would love to have done science. Uh, the real action, though, wasn't in plant physiology. It was um, upstairs, I thought, in entomology, <laughs> where the, the subjects actually ran around. So this is, is um, a poem about insects, one particular tiny type, Orthosmitia rayi. Gnats, in clouds above the river's sheen, loop in and out the ceaseless maze they are, being both particles of light and waves of gnat. Thought's tiny juggling feet, and more, the whine of a new idea at the bright meniscus of mind. On such an afternoon, Heisenberg might have come to formulate his delta x by delta p is equal to or greater than Planck's constant over 2 pi. Uncertainly, I pin down neither gnat nor thought, but strain at this paradigm for a poem. Over the gnats and me, marshmallow cumulus float by, far off thought balloons, to us blank as eternity. Thank you. Also from Holding Patterns, get your copy now. Uh, next we have Steve Evans. Are you here, Steve? Come on up. Thank you. Uh, the only reason I really appeared here was because Mike said he was going to wear the same jumper and... We've done double acts before, but we haven't actually dressed alike. So. <laughs> anyway, um, I was thinking about how we change the landscape of the Earth so dramatically, but then how a lot of the changes that are occurring are at a much smaller level, and that made me think about genetic engineering. Luminous fruit with uh, an epigram, epigram. Pigs 
bred with implanted jellyfish genes, have noses that glow in the dark. Not a very useful uh, additional feature, I would have thought. But anyway, Giotto's lemons had it, but all those fat balls of incandescence that loomed from his painted plate, like half-warmed streetlights, could not have foreseen this. We can now read by the light of a bowl of cherries. Though I prefer the wattage of a duchess pear for a good mystery, and the ceiling in my bedrooms hung with satsuma plums, their fleshy glow just right for an erotic novella. Outside, the night's so bright we forget what darkness was. The streets are a constellation of flirting colours. The vast orchards of the eastern valleys wink advertisements into space and the whole planet's surface is littered with the organic glitter of luminous fruit. We are awash in the juice of their light. Thank you. Steve, what a fantastic picture you paint there um, of the science that could be luminous fruit. There you go. And last but not least, we have Kate Dello Evans, who's going to be reading Gastric Juice. Thank you so much. I dropped out of medical school to become a poet. <laughs> I didn't know how broke you'd be. <laughs> Gastric juice. Pumped from my stomach, juice sharp enough it dissolves gold, houses bugs crazy for the pH, dismembering car strength acid, parts set out in the wrecker's yard, millimetre by millimetre shedding metal skin, like my guts, cell by cell, sloughing off the lining, just as in oysters, where hourly irritation, grain by grain, sand creates pearls. My ulcer, a flaming jewel of passion. <laughs> Congratulations. And both, both of those poems came from Law and Impulse, uh, which is maths and chemistry poems. So congratulations. W well done. Now, of course, uh, we cannot have these readings without getting the, the grand dam, the, um, the, uh, the leader of this poetry insurgency, to, uh, to lead us on, give her a bit of uh, her own poetry. So come on up, Carol. Who was it that said there's nothing like a day? It wasn't Margaret Thatcher we're talking about either. Um, I'm going to read some poems. Some of them are choices driven by some of the items we've touched on today. But the first one, I'm going, they're all from Fishing in the Devonian. And Fishing, I'll read you the title poem. This was inspired by the discovery of the fantastic uh, fossil fish, Tiktaalik rosia, and also a little bit of a um, satire on, let's say, science journalism and that most popular genre of literary works, The Fishing Guide. <laughs> Try Ellesmere Island when it's green and still attached to Greenland. One fish, Tiktaalik rosia, is having second thoughts about the water. It's perfectly clean, but there is the attractive ooze of mudflats with mortals of scorpions and millipedes. Though you can't say millipedes in the Devonian as there are no fingers to count on or Greek prefaces for 1,000. The fish are inclined to muddiness, mud not being much of a flavour even for Devonians. How they throng up and over the shore on their finned lobes so maybe you don't have to throw a line in, in the classic sense, as that Tiktaalika is trying its best to get out, get the morning papers and have a neck to look around. Devonian fish come in metres, so consider scrupulously the best kind of hook and bait, what kind of gloves you need to get that hook out. Perhaps don't go out in a small boat built of spongy Devonian wood, not much by way of secondary thickening, though a stout source of carbon. There's a lot to think about in fishing in the Devonian, so pack thoughtfully. Um, this, this is a poem um, called Pet Facts, and PET is uh, the acronym for Positron Emission Tomatography. And um, I think it's fairly explanatory. 
in an experiment with radioactive glucose area 25 PET scanning and terms of endearment, neurologists have located the sadness centre in the brain where tiny families sit down for afternoon tea when the baby dies at the hospital and a woman stands looking out the window saying, it's over, it's over, under her breath. It has an empty bookshelf, the first Christmas card you ever made, dear mummy, and a handkerchief. They have found a little door to the sadness centre and with the help of an electrode, they can put a closed sign on the door to tell the thoughts that want to hang around and be miserable that no one's home and don't come back either. Um, picking up on that theme that was mentioned earlier of tenderness, I think uh, this is probably what I think is one of the most tender things I've ever written. It's about the expanding universe, a subject not normally associ associated with tenderness, but really, like every poem, it's the subtext is a love story. When years take the stars away. If you're reading this in 100 million 2007 AD, that is, after all the stars have inched away, taking their tails of light with them, far off, to where the universe strikes a light against what, at the time of writing, has no dimension. The timeless place that time is coming to. I want to tell you that here, right now, the sky is prinked with nebula in clusters and symposia. The light is mostly white, so you get the true idea of blackness, and the abundance is such that it presses infinities into the foreheads of children lying safe in their beds at night. And those who can get out from the cities and take the time to sit outside make up elaborate stories concerning these embroideries of starlight. And if a meteorite rushes burning into the Earth's air, wonderment bubbles up into this strange satisfaction which might be happiness. I want you to know, as you sit reading this on your black and starless planet, that you should not find that blank blanket of night a reason to believe that stars do not exist. The galaxies, the Milky Ways, and the jewel of Magellan's clouds still shine and burn abundance in distant orbits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol Jenkins. Um, wow, so what a fabulous project. So congratulations. We're going to uh, take a little bit of break. Remember, you can collect these books. These are a limited print run. You can actually get some of the poets to s autograph them if you like, you know, if you really ask nicely. Um, and uh, yeah, please avail yourself of drinks and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>